Hello everyone and welcome to our lecture on chapter 9, Assessment of Intelligence. So compared to some of the other lectures, this one's going to be a little bit shorter just because a lot of the assessments that are used to measure intelligence are required, people who are administering them are required to have a PhD or specific coursework in intelligence and it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Um, so we won't be spending a ton of time talking about it in this lecture, but I do want to go over some of the basic information about intelligence assessments and what y'all might need to know in case you run across intelligence assessments in your clinical work. So in order to begin our discussion, we really have to talk about how intelligence has been defined because intelligence has been defined using various theoretical frameworks throughout the last century. And historically, intelligence was defined by examining individual differences through sensory processes and mental tests. But over time, these individual tests were formulized to help detect intellectual disabilities by interpreting a calculated IQ score. That was the original purpose of intelligence tests, was to be able to identify who are the children in school that are going to be the most likely to do well in school and should continue with school, and who are the individuals who are likely going to struggle intellectually and should be pulled out of school. And the way that that determination was made was through an interpreted IQ score. We also quickly established group intelligence tests, which were used to help classify army recruits, but were then later designed for educational and other personnel uses. So group intelligence tests really started after World War I to help place soldiers. And after that, it sort of expanded into other avenues related to education and job placement. But there were also some of these theories of intelligence that really form some of our understanding of intelligence today. And the first of those was Charles Spearman's G factor, which assumes that there is a general factor of intelligence that's indicated by a composite score on several cognitive tests. And each of those composite scores or those cognitive tests were given a, an S factor. And all of those S factors combined to create the overall general intelligence factor, which Spearman called the G factor. And Spearman found that individuals who performed well on the cognitive tests, those S tests, tended to perform well on others. And he assumed that this meant that there was one underlying factor of intelligence. So that's why he said that G factor is much more important than S factors because there's some, there must be some underlying general ability of intelligence. And although Spearman did identify these, that these S factors existed on various subtests, he asserted that the G factor was more influential in understanding intelligence. And this is a sentiment that has carried since Spearman's discussion of intelligence. We still see this coming up in our understanding of intelligence today, that a lot of people are looking at the ways that there is some underlying consistency of intelligence. But we also have Lewis Thurstone, who identified seven group or multiple factors that he labeled as the primary mental abilities. And these primary mental abilities included verbal comprehension, word fluency, numerical ability, spatial visualization, associative memory, perceptual speed, and reasoning. He, his later research indicated that the primary mental abilities were correlated with one another, and then he came to a similar conclusion as Charles Spearman and said, intelligence can be interpreted as a general factor as well as these seven second order factors or these primary mental abilities. So he's starting to move into, yes, there are these specific areas where we do well, but they're so correlated with one another that there must be some general factor of intelligence. And we also have the cattell horn carroll theory of cognitive ability, which conceptualizes intelligence as two different types of intelligence, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence was intended to measure context-free capacity for solving new problems. So this is your ability to perform when you have no exposure to any content. When you are first given a task, you've never seen it before, how do you problem solve it? Are you able to adapt to that situation? 
And then crystallized intelligence involves the individual solving problems and making decisions based on their previous learning or experience. So crystallized intelligence was the type of learning that was more considered to be culturally based learning because it was much more to do with what are the actual facts and information that you have been taught in school. And we actually still use these terms in intelligence testing today, crystallized and fluid intelligence, though they are conceptualized in a little bit different ways. The next theorist who sort of informed our theories of intelligence was Robert Sternberg and his triarchic theory, which involves three types of intelligence. Compen competential, oh my goodness, competential intelligence, experiential intelligence, and contextual intelligence. Compensual intelligence referred to the components of intelligence, such as executive functioning and knowledge acquisition ability. So your ability to create, to plan, to organize, as well as your ability to acquire new knowledge. Experiential intelligence was related to the ability garnered from previous behaviors and experiences. So have you learned over time? Do you adapt to situations based on what you've learned? And contextual intelligence referred to one's adaptability to their environment. So are they able to problem solve in the moment? And we also had Howard Gardner, who was certain that there were eight types of intelligence or what he deemed to be the multiple intelligences. And those included musical, bodily or kinesthetic, logical, mathematical, linguistic, spatial, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and the naturalistic intelligence. And he says, Howard Garner proposed that all of us possess each one of these intelligences at some degree. But all of us are going to have specific types of intelligence in which we are more versed, in which we know more or we are more skilled. And he really noted that this approach to intelligence allowed us to move away from the general intelligence model that was originally proposed by Spearman and a really gave us an opportunity to see clients for everything that they're good at because there are different ways that we can express our intelligence. So out of these theories of intelligence came this desire for us as clinicians to have individual tests that we can use to measure intelligence. And there are several individual intelligence tests that counselors should be aware of when working with clients of all ages, and they vary in terms of how applicable they are. One of the first was the Stanford Binet, which became the best known intelligence test in the world and was used as the gold standard against which all other intelligence tests that were developed were validated. The Stanford Binet was the first intelligence test. And right now we're in the fifth edition of the Stanford Binet, which is based on the Cattell, Horn, and Carroll theory of intelligence. And the Stanford Binet can be administered to individuals between the ages of two and over 85 years of age. And there are two routing tests that are included. And from those routing tests, you will generate for a client a full scale IQ score with five factor index scores. And those five factors will give an index score in fluid reasoning, knowledge, quantitative reasoning, visual spatial processing, and working memory. Overall, the Sanford Binet takes about 45 to 75 minutes to administer. And originally, the Stanford Binet was developed for children with some more difficult items that were then later added to make the Stanford Binet ap applicable to adults. And because the Stanford Binet was so geared towards children at its beginning, there was this huge push and need for us to be able to assess intelligence in adults. So that is where we developed what's called the Wexler scales. And the Wexler scales were discovered and developed by David Wexler. And he believed that there was a need for intelligence tests that were more suitable than the, than the Stanford Binet in terms of being suitable for adults. So he developed the Wexler scales that provided and paved the way for what we now use as the number one 
measure of intelligence amongst most children and adults. The Wechsler scales are the A plus standard in our current world. So the Wechsler scales are a series of intelligence tests that include the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, the Wechsler Intelligence Scale for Children, the Wechsler Preschool and Primary School Scale of Intelligence, and the Wechsler Abbreviated Scale of Intelligence. So we're going to go into a little bit of detail on each of these just so that you know what they are. So the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale is oftentimes just called the WAIS, the W-A-I-S, it's just called the WAIS. And it's in its fourth edition, published in 2008, and can be used with adults all across the lifespan. When you administer the Wechsler scale, it will render a full-scale IQ score, which is based on seven core subtests. It will give in a general abilities index, which is based on six subtests because it removes the element of processing speed from someone's score. So that you can see if you eliminate the timed component of many of the uh, assessments within the ways how well is someone's ability how versed is their ability is maybe a better way to say it and then there are four index scores and the four index scores are measured in verbal comprehension perceptual reasoning working memory and processing speed and although the wexler scale especially the waste is the a plus standard for adult intelligence testing it takes around two hours to administer for assessors who are versed in the scale. Typically when people are first administering the, the WACE, it takes about two and a half to three hours for one administration for the 10 core subtests. And as you get a little bit more versed, it can decrease to around two hours for administration. Um, the WACE 4 was normed on a sample of over 2,000 individuals in the United States and the demographics of that stratify of that sample were stratified to match the demographics of the United States in terms of age, gender, race, ethnicity, geographic region, and education level. But it is important to note that the waste still relies very heavily on information that's taught in the U.S. education system, specifically at schools with adequate, adequate resources. So keep in mind that the WACE is the most applicable to individuals who are still in school or who are working in related professions where the information that's learned in school will be applicable to their job. That's why the WACE is really good for young adults and early adulthood, but not necessarily as you get into older adulthood, just because of the emphasis on information learned in school. And... One of the downsides to the waste is that it is incredibly intensive, labor intensive in administration, scoring, and interpretation. As I mentioned, administration takes about two hours, scoring takes an additional about an hour and a half, and then interpretation takes about another half an hour after that. So it is an extensive test, and because it is so labor intensive, it's recommended that it's only used in high stakes testing situations. Then the, the Wechsler Intelligence Scale for Children is oftentimes just called the WISC, the W-I-S-C. It's in its fifth edition, which was published in 2014. It's intended for children between the ages of 6 and 16 years and 11 months, so just before someone turns 17. And the results of the WISC will provide a full-scale IQ score, five primary index scores, and ancillary scale scores and the five primary index scales are verbal comprehension visual spatial fluid reasoning working memory and processing speed so similar overlaps to the waste in fact a lot of the subtests are very similar if not the same just at a level that would be more appropriate for children and then we have the wexler preschool primary scale of intelligence which is often oftentimes just called the WIPSI. And the WIPSI is in its fourth edition, published in 2012. It's suitable for children between the ages of 2.6 and 7.7 .7 years of age, so really young children. It will provide a full-scale IQ score, primary index scores, and ancillary index scores, though the number of primary and ancillary index scores will vary depending on the age of the child because it's such a small range of children for whom the WIPSI is appropriate, you are able to tailor the assessment to them. And then the Wechsler Abbreviated Scale of Intelligence, oftentimes just called the WASI, the W-A-S-I, the WASI, 
can be used for individuals between the ages of 6 and 89 when you're really only needing a brief intelligence evaluation. So the way the WASI was published in 1999 and takes between 15 and 30 minutes to administer because there are fewer subtests. There are only two scales that are given in addition to full scale IQ. And so it's just a lot faster. And research does indicate that this shortened format will, impla will impact clinical accuracy compared to other intelligence tests. So it is really not recommended to use the WACE if your client needs a more accurate measure of intelligence. And a couple of other famous individual intelligence scores are the Kaufman batteries, which consist of the Kaufman assessment for children and the Kaufman adolescent and adult intelligence test. And I'm going to get these up on here for you. And the former is in its second edition and can be used with children between the ages of 3 and 18 years old. And practitioners can use up to 10 of the 18 subtests to calculate six different abilities index indices. So as a clinician, you get to tailor your assessment to the client and you have your choice between 18 subtests. You only need to administer 10. So that way you can get that full, full scale IQ score, which is really helpful if you have individuals who have been exposed to intelligence tests before. You can eliminate subtests to which they are familiar and replace it with something else. The adult and adolescent intelligence test is available in a shortened form and it's used for individuals between the ages of 11 and 85 and the results of the adolescent and adult intelligence test provide scores for fluid intelligence, crystallized intelligence, and a general composite score. We also have the Daz Naglery, Daz Naglery cognitive assessment system, which is intended to be a comprehensive measure of children's cognitive abilities. It provides scores on four scales based on the PASS system. So it assesses for planning, attention, simultaneous, and successive cognitive processing. I will say that the Kaufman batteries, the Daz Naglery, and the Woodcock Johnson are not as known in terms of intelligence just because a lot of people rely on the WISC or sorry, the WACE and the Stanford Binet. Which leads me to the Woodcock Johnson test of cognitive abilities, oftentimes just called the, the WJ of cognitive abilities. And it's in its fourth edition, published in 2014. It, is, it has a series of 20 intelligence tests that yield three composite scores, seven factor scores, and six narrow ability scores. It's out there, though a lot of people rely more heavily on the the, Weiss, the Wexler scales and the Stanford Binet. There are some additional assessments that can be used, which include the Peabody Vocabulary Test, as well as the Wide Range Intelligence Test. And similar to the ones that I've already talked about, they're not as popular as the Wexler and the Stanford Binet. So overall, there are some advantages to doing individual intelligence testing. Namely, intelligence tests will provide you as a counselor with an opportunity to interpret several different, several different types of IQ scores in addition to developing a more complex report of patterns among IQ subtests, which can, which can be indicative of a client's functioning as well as their possible dysfunctioning. Some research indicates that some of the subtests of individual intelligence tests can be unreliable, but given the complexity and variability of subtests and the constructs they intend to measure, it's important for assessors to account for this information during interpretation, as well as the functional utility of intelligence testing for each individual client. And intelligence tests are not without their disadvantage. Namely, as I've already mentioned, intelligence tests can be costly in terms of time and money. And one of the biggest downsides is that most counselors lack training opportunities to administer the tests because intelligence tests require a highly trained examiner with considerable training and practice in administering each test. And unfortunately, there are very limited training opportunities. Typically, they are only offered in doctoral programs in psychology for counseling, clinical, and forensic psychology. In fact, at least at CSU, students are required to take an entire semester course on intelligence tests, and you would practice administering the Wexler scales at least, I want to say about six or seven times before you ever sit down with a client and administer in an actual assessment. So it's high stakes in terms of training as well as 
the cost. So I haven't talked about this very much, but each of these intelligence tests costs money, not only for the materials that are required, but also in terms of what you have to charge a client to be able to use it to run their scores. And for each person, it can run into about $500 depending on the intelligence test that you're using. And as a client, if you're billing that to the client, it adds up very quickly, which sort of paved the way for the next stage of intelligence tests that really have taken hold in a lot of societies or in a lot of environments, which is group intelligence tests. Because individual intelligence tests were not without their faults. And as counselors, there was this huge push to use group intelligence tests to assess the cognitive abilities of clients because they were more of these group intelligence tests were more efficient both in time and cost across administration, the required materials and the scoring procedures. So the development of group intelligence tests was stimulate, stimulated by the need to classify almost 2 million U.S. Army recruits during World War One, And then group intelligence after that became sort of needed and emphasized and developed in educational and personnel sort of environments. And there are three common group intelligence tests that are used in schools. Those are the cognitive abilities test, the test of cognitive skills, and the Otis Lennon school ability test. The Cognitive Abilities Test was published as Form 6 and has two additions to serve three levels for kindergarten through grade 2 and a multi-level addition that serves grades 3 through 12. And the Cognitive Abilities Test is composed of three batteries to assess verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal abilities. The Test of Cognitive Skills is intended for use in kindergarten through, age tw through grade 12 with levels that cover the well, that will cover two grade levels. There are four tests associated with the tool. They include sequences, analogies, memory, and verbal reasoning. And then the Otis Lennon School Ability Test is in its eighth edition and serves those who are in kindergarten through grade 12, yielding a total IQ score as well as verbal and nonverbal scores. There are some other group intelligence tests that are designed to be used within a in a wider variety of settings outside of sort of school age children. And they include the Shipley Institute of Living Scale, the Wonderlick Personnel Test and Scholastic Level Exam, and the Multidimensional Aptitude Battery. So the, sorry about that y'all. So the Shipley Institute of Living Skills is intended for use across the lifespan, specifically for detecting intellectual ability. The Wonderlick Personnel Test and Scholastic Level Exam is a brief intelligence test for adults. And this tool has been used for employment screening, but it, its use has faced legal challenges given its questionable validity with racial and ethnic minorities because the test was used historically to unfairly deny BIPOC individuals opportunities for fair employment. And the multidimensional aptitude battery is in its second edition, which includes 10 tests that measure verbal and nonverbal performance. And the scale provides a total score as well as a subscale score for verbal and nonverbal performance. The battery can be taken directly on most computers with software that presents instructions, practice items, it times the subtest, scores them, and produces four different types of interpretive reports. So the multidimensional aptitude battery is incredibly easy to use. It's really quick, but it is important to notice that the examiner who is using the multidimensional aptitude battery isn't able to use observational data of their clients which can be important if you need that information. So it is not recommended to use the multidimensional aptitude battery for high testing, high stakes testing situations. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about giftedness and creativity because children who are identified as gifted are oftentimes characterized with various academic and social challenges, particularly those individuals who are racial and ethnic minorities because these individuals may be demonstrating underachievement in school as well as negative attitudes from other people towards these children who are labeled as gifted as well as just lower access to gifted programs 
And standardized intelligence tests have historically and typically been used to identify giftedness. Even though or although giftedness is defined in a variety of ways, we still use these standardized intelligence tests. The most common standardized tests that are used to measure giftedness are the Wechsler scales and the Stanford Binet tests. There are a couple of additional tests that will assess for giftedness and creativity that are a little bit more specific outside of that standardized intelligence. And one of those is the Torrance tests of creativity, which is commonly used to assess creativity, which is one prominent form of giftedness. And the test provides scores for four creative abilities, fluency, flexibility, originality, and elaboration. So as you can see, there's sort of this wide range of intelligence tests, but all of them tend to overlap quite a bit in that most intelligence tests now have some general abilities index, whether that's IQ, full scale IQ, or some composite score, as well as some individual subtests. And overall, you have your pick of tests. It's really finding the test that makes the most sense for your client. But at the master's level, you are probably not going to be administering an, an intelligence test just because it does require such high level of training that isn't offered in most, if not any, master's level course. So that is where we are going to wrap up our lecture on chapter nine. And as always, here are the questions to help you make sure that you're gathering the most important aspects of this chapter while you are studying. I will see you all in the next lecture.